But I wanted to start off by coming back to something that uh, popped up in almost all of the talks we heard uh, at the beginning, and that's this question of growth. And I guess my question is, how long can the economy keep growing? And if it uncouples from fossil fuels, the way Marin is describing, does that mean that the economy can grow forever? I don't ask easy questions. Why would I? Uh... Well, look, this question of growth, I think, is fundamental. Um, and I say that because we now live in an economy which is predicated on growth and continual growth. And the, the problem is that, and, and David explained this uh, somewhat in his remarks, and others have said the same thing, is that the nature of the growth that we have has, is putting an untenable burden on the biosphere. And, and yet every time you come forward with proposals to reduce that burden, the first test that you have to pass is, well, what will it do for growth? And if it will impede growth, then your proposal doesn't have much chance. So some things do get through. Some of the green investments that were described uh, pass that test because they're, they, are, they can make money in the normal way and add to growth. But there are many, many kinds of investments that I believe we have to make in order to reduce the burden of our economy on the impact that don't have a financial return, therefore don't show up in gross domestic product and therefore don't show up in our key, uh, leading measure of growth. So there are some sim fairly simple things that I think we, we can be clear on, and that is that what has to stop growing and even shrink is the extent to which our economy uses materials and energy that's extracted from the environment and puts waste back into the environment. This is a key message of ecological economics, that th th those links between the economy and the biosphere, which have so long been neglected by the mainstream, now have to be made central to our thinking. So once we can clarify what the level of reduction in the material and energy inputs of the economy can be in order to satisfy these objectives about clean air, clean water, and so on, then it really doesn't matter after that what the economy as economy does, whether there are ways of making that number GDP continue to grow even as we clamp down on the use of materials and energy, and I should also say the, the transformation of space, because we're transforming, transforming land from one use to another and, 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 and gradually squeezing out the habitat of, uh, of other species. Once we, we discipline ourselves not to do that, then what the economy can do, well, we'll just have to see. Personally, I don't think it will be able to sustain growth in the traditional way, but that's a, that's a matter for further debate. So that might not be heresy anymore on the university campus, but I want to hear from Andrea on this. Can you get elected if you don't believe in perpetual growth? Uh, well, I guess I would be living proof of that. I've been elected four times, three in a row, actually, on the Greenest City program. It's uh, listening to Peter. Oh, so the one thing you didn't hear in the titles I have is university graduate. So I'm definitely not an economist and didn't even make it to university because because there were other things to do in life, like change the world. So um, I. I don't know that I'm definitely not going to articulate it as well, but I will tell you there's this fundamental, what I have found is an inconsistency that I think you've just explained in our Greenest City work. So in six years, we've reduced water use by 18%. We've reduced waste going to landfill and incinerator by 18%. We have decreased greenhouse gas emissions by 10% per capita, 7% overall. We've, uh, we, we've, accomplished a lot, really, in six years. We're now the fourth greenest city on the planet, although we didn't even rate when we started six years ago. But at the same time, our economy has grown quite substantially and will actually be the fastest growing economy in Canada this next year. Um, and, and I've tried to reconcile that, right? I know that's about resilience and about the fact that we have built an economy with the 99% of jobs that actually exist and really work to support those rather than things like LNG that don't exist and don't contribute to our economy as it sits right now. Um, but I've never quite been able to figure out why we're growing our economy so fast when we're doing the things, we're taking uh, inputs out that could create outputs, but it is about efficiency. Ultimately green, like when we talk to people about green, um, it's about using resources more efficiently. That's what green is, right? It's about less waste, whether that's a waste of emissions, a waste of toxins, a waste of 
um, air, whatever it is, a waste of water. So when we are using it more efficiently, why wouldn't the economy be able to grow in that in the ways that Peter was talking about? Response uh, to that? Two replies. Uh, look, I'd love nothing more than for Vancouver to genuinely be the greenest city in the, in the world. I'd prefer it if it was second and Toronto was first, but dream on. Um, Go Leafs. The, a lot depends upon what you measure. Now, the sorts of measurements you described, and I'm sure you've got more to look at, are all very locally defined. Um, I was looking the other day at um, greenhouse gas emissions not generated in British Columbia, but embodied in all of the products that British Columbians buy. So if you um, buy an increasing quantity of products produced in China, and China uses uh, production methods which generate a lot of greenhouse gases, that should be assigned to British Columbians as part of their impact on the biosphere. But if you just look at the... And for the record, Greenest City but, does measure that. So it's not, we, we were not trying to outsource um, the production you may not, of You're carbon. not trying to do it, yeah. but it happens, it happens willy-nilly. A, a Walmart opens up, it fills its, uh, it, its shelves with products made outside of the, of the region. You are, re when, when, when people buy those products, they're, I would say, responsible for the greenhouse gases that were generated in the production and transportation of those products. So you have to, and this of course is the, 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 the great strength of the ecological footprint invented right here in British Columbia by Bill Rees and Mattis Wackernagel, which tells us that what we have to look at when you look at the economic, ecological impact of an economic activity is you've got to trace that all around the globe. And then if Vancouver can emerge as the top, uh, the greenest city in the world with the high consumption level that exists here, um, I will be, uh, I'll become a sociologist or something. <laughs> okay, I want to hear from David on this. Because we just, we just touched on this question of consumption. And I remember being a kid and riding the subway in, in Toronto, and there you were on the, on the wall with the, uh, the giant caulking gun. You know, and, and a lot of your public profile for many decades was around the consumer choices that people could make to basically make less impact, to pollute less, right, as a consumer society. Now I see you shifting into this policy, grassroots, organizing, messy, unglamorous political church basement world. And I'm wondering, where are we at in that balance between individual responsibilities as consumers and this notion of people as, as citizens putting pressure on a government to set that policy framework? Yeah, well, you know, when I think about the, uh, the motion politically over the last 30 years, I despair. Uh, I just want to remind you, in 1988, around the world, the environment had reached the top of the agenda. So high in America that a guy ran for president of the United States and said, if you elect me, I will be an environmental president. That's George H.W. Bush. He didn't have a green bone in his body, but the Americans had made him say it. 1988, Brian Mulroney was re-elected, and to show he cared about the environment, he appointed his brightest star to be the minister of the environment, Lucien Bouchard. I interviewed Lucien four months after he was put in as minister. I said, what do you think is the most important uh, uh, issue that faces Canadians today? And right away he said, global warming. And I said, how important is it? He said, and these are his exact words, it threatens the survival of our species. We have to act now. So we had reached that level of concern. And what one despairs uh, about is where we are now. How many years later is that? 30 years later, we've gone uh, backwards. So when you look at the reluctance at these higher levels to do anything about this issue, it makes one despair. But that's why I feel that this election for Canadians is, is, uh, is really critical. But I believe underlying all of these issues, you know, people ask me, kids ask me all the time, is the issue the most important issue climate change? Or is it species extinction? Is it toxic pollution? Is it ocean acidification? Uh, which one should I focus on as the most? And I say, these are all important. I have no idea which one is going to finally do us in. But <laughs> underlying, underlying all of these, 
what's causing this is the human mind and the values and the beliefs we cling to that shape the way we interact with that world. And that's the challenge. How do we shift the paradigm? How do we shift the way that we, we see the world? And that, to me, has got to start at the grassroots, and we have to just work on it at that level. And that's too slow is the problem for the challenge we face. You're talking about storytelling. A lot, at the grassroots level, it is storytelling. Let me tell you a story. <laughs> uh, I was four years old, living in Marpole, Vancouver, and Dad was taking me by streetcar downtown to watch to see a movie. And I looked at a street, uh, the sign in the streetcar, and I said, Dad, I can read. That sign says, do not spit. In 1940, there were signs everywhere telling people that you shouldn't, you know, there were spittoons and bars and like, uh, and cut, people gobbed everywhere and you had to tell them, don't spit here. Now, you know, there, there are a lot of countries where, uh, where people, I, uh, the first time I went to China in 1976, we filmed an operation uh, using acupuncture on a woman's neck and the surgeon was leaning over her neck. He stepped back from the table, pulled his mask down, and gobbed on the floor in the operating room. So, you know, spitting is something that is, is done all over the place. Cut ahead 70 years. We don't have signs anywhere saying do not spit. There are no spittoons. There are no spit police. We don't tell kids in kindergarten you don't spit. But we, we have changed in terms of our culture so that gobbing in public or on floors is not what we as Canadians think is being Canadian. So I'm going to push back. But in terms of the environment, we're still back. We've got to say, do not litter, do not do. <clears throat> so until we incorporate that into who we are and what we are, then I think we'll keep making all these problems. The difference is there's no multi-billion dollar spittoon industry that can hire lobbyists and buy politicians <laughs> Right? It's a lot easier to change public behavior when you're not fighting against the most capital-intensive industry in well, the world, Well, the right? tobacco industry had a good run at it, but uh, ultimately a very big shift. Well, I mean, I used to smoke, and I remember in class at UBC, I'd smoke right in class and put it out on the floor, right? Like, and that's happened pretty... Uh, there's been quite a shift in... in so behavioral shift is possible. <laughs> yeah. Marin, you, in, your, in your work with policymakers and decision makers, you must sometimes feel like the, you know, David versus Goliath, because I don't know how often you get to talk to a minister. For every time you get to talk to a minister, you can guarantee there's a dozen meetings from every one of the companies that oppose exactly. every piece of the work that you're doing. Exactly. So what is, what is the role then? I'm trying to figure out the, the connection between the storytelling at an individual level and the tipping point that we need to reach in this larger conversation. Can you, can you give some insight into that from your conversations with decision makers? Well, I... <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm, I'm pointing at Marin because she's uh, oh, good, with Clean good. Energy Canada. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, you know, I think actually you're right. They're in there, the, the oil and gas companies, they're in and out of that revolving door, um, talking to the decision makers. But I think that's where the, the power comes in part from the numbers of the investment, the jobs, like that growing story. Uh, and here in Canada, what people are taking note of is Canada being left behind. Can, you know, and look, Premier Notley was in Montreal, New York, uh, and Toronto this week, um, announcing that they're going to do something different. Her Minister of Environment, her Minister of Energy saying, if we're going to ignore that the energy economy is changing, you know, we're going to lose out. So, you know, I'm not naive. I don't think this is going to change overnight. But I think, one, there's that power from the, the fact that the world is tra changing and there's, uh, you know, the technologies are changing and who wants to put gas in their car? The public does not want to breathe air that's from coal-fired electricity. And Ontario phased out coal-fired electricity, first jurisdiction in North America to do that. The public doesn't want to buy um, gasoline and put it in their car, you know, and as people say, as soon as I can afford that electric vehicle, that's what I'm going to buy. So there's a willingness on the public part. So the power is in uh, where the technology is going. And I'd say the second piece of power is, you know, people like Dogwood, people like the David Suzuki Foundation, you know, people like you who are out there 
um, getting the public to speak out to politicians because politicians, you know, money speaks, but people speak, voters speak more. And I would say we're seeing, you're seeing leadership coming in Quebec, you're seeing leadership come in Ontario. These are places where the public really believes in a clean energy economy and you're seeing politicians. It's a grind, it's slow step forward. But if you think of the, the cell phone technology, the digital communications technology, uh, in 1989, AT&T commissioned, you know, McKinsey to do a study, or not McKinsey, uh, you know, KPMG or someone like that to do public opinion study. What, how, many, how many cell phones do you think we will sell, you know, next year? How many cell phones? And they did all their research. They came out with 100,000 cell phones. We think you'll sell 100,000 cell phones next year. And, uh, no, in five years, in five years. When five years came, they sold 100,000 cell phones in the first three days. The technology had changed. The public goes there. It's gonna be a bit more to change the energy infrastructure, but that's the rate of change I think we're gonna see once we hit the tipping point. David, you're shaking your head. I, I hate this kind of a discussion <laughs> because you're allowing the economy still to be the, the, the frame within which you're, you're you're talking, and I just don't see that we're going to get out of this if we keep doing that. So I think we're seeing a spectrum, right? There's the, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, speak the language of the industry and decision makers in order to beat them on the facts, right? And at the other end of the spectrum, you're saying, get rid of that broken paradigm. Andrea, you look like you were about to jump in. I gotta admit, as, as the only elected official on the stage, it is a bit challenging to hear what moves politicians' mind one way or the other. So I'm not gonna suggest I speak for, well, a whole huge whack of elected officials, but I can tell you what moves my mind. Um, and I, I, it has not changed at all from the day before I got elected to the day today, many years after getting elected. What changed my mind is vision. Are you fighting for something? What is it you want me to vote to support? If all we're doing, and, and I have worked as an environmental advocate, I ran the Wilderness Committee, I fought against a lot of things because they desperately needed somebody to stop them so we had a chance to build this better future. But if you cannot articulate what you're fighting for, you can't get my support because I have nothing to support you for. You're just asking me to, to fight a rear guard action. Um, we do a lot of land use and zoning in the city of Vancouver. If somebody comes with a proposal for housing and your only response to that is no, no, like, no, not something else that you want, you're giving me an impossible choice. I have a choice to vote for housing or nothing. Well, some housing is always gonna be better than nothing in this city, and, and I think we do the same on the environment. We say, we're against pipelines, we're against LNG, we're against this, we're against that. Tell us what you're fighting for, and it's why we've been electorally successful here in Vancouver. We're not against, we don't have the not wanting to be the not brownest city on earth initiative. We have a goal. We want to be the greenest city on earth. And Steve, uh, Peter, I'll send you the, the plan. It does include ecological footprint measurement as well as local production. And we are outperforming any city in the developed world on both fronts because we're fighting for something. And people get behind it when they see those goals down on paper. So I, I'm, I didn't know whether you were responding to me and my objection to the the frame. But this is the, the, the battle that we had during the 70s when the forestry battles in BC were raging. And one of the, uh, one of the CEOs of, of a major forest company sent a, a note to all of the mayors saying environmentalists are against everything. They're against progress. They're against uh, the industry. Uh, and, and I couldn't understand what the hell he was saying. We're for clean air. We're for clean water. We're for uh, a, a future rich in opportunity. I, I, it, I don't know why environmentalists would be seen as against things. Peter? Oh. I, I, I really like your comment about being for something. And I think that, again, being here to speak on behalf of ecological economics, there's a lot that we're for. Um, we're for employment, we're for a redistribution of wealth, we're for all of the environmental agenda that we've been talking about, we're for safer uh, communities, we're for people having more leisure time uh, so that they can spend with their family and friends. Uh, there's, there's a big agenda, if you look at the literature, that's what we're for. The problem is that we've, uh, and I don't want to harp on this too much, but the problem is that 
there's a sense out there that growth gets you all those things. And therefore, as long as you're pro-growth, you can more or less take it as given that you're going to have all of these other good things. That's a fundamental mistake. And so whilst other politicians, present company accepted, um, say, well, we can't compromise on growth because growth is what's going to give us more taxes and we'll be able to buy more things and invest in more technology uh, we, we, uh, and employ more people. Uh, we can't give up on that. I just don't think that argument stands up anymore. And I think we, ecological economists, have a responsibility to do a better job than we've done to date to lay out in more clear and careful terms how it's possible to have a more genuinely prosperous society which isn't predicated on growth and in particular isn't predicated on an increasing burden on the biosphere. I think we can do that. And uh, that's, I think, what's going to be among the discussions we're going to have in the next two days in our wonderful conference. Yeah, I was just, uh, I agree. You can't have growth that at the way that the economy is working and protect the environment over the long run and that those changing those um, indicators that you talked about, new systems for how are we going to actually define what is uh, the well-being of society. That's, that's the key to this. And I actually really give credit to the ecological economists for the work they've done, you know, and for having a public forum to actually bring this conversation out of sort of the academic circles and really trying and the work that's been done over decades, literally. Um, so when I'm talking about jobs and investment dollars, it's not because I'm a proponent of growth. I'm a proponent, as you said, of talking the language of politicians so that they can hear it in the way they can hear. And brilliant politicians like Andrea really listen to vision and, and can see vision and understand vision. Others are really looking at how are they going to actually, you know, in their communities, defend jobs. And so that's part of the conversation. It's not about growth. It's about how are we going to create new jobs, um, those kind of jobs that are going to keep those politicians getting elected and are going to be in this more um, prosperous society from a well-being perspective where people are truly living a better quality of life, not one with more stuff. I have a question for uh, Miles. <clears throat> All right. I, I think the, the original question um, on has, has the responsibility skewed too far toward elected political leaders away from the individual. I think, um, you know, I agree with your, Andrea's characterization of that, is that pe voters, individual consumers, however you see yourself, need to be eternally vigilant if, if our political institutions are going to work. You know, they're not perfect. There isn't a perfect one that exists. We got to make them work. And I think that the, sent the responsibility for our collective actions has skewed too much toward the elected representatives and, and their institutions that we have to as individuals maintain a sense of responsibility. Not over our choices, you know, the choices we make in the ballot box are huge. The choices we make in consuming and, and how we manage um, waste and all that are huge also. But we, we can't just let those go too far away from ourselves. And I think with the crises that we're facing now, with the challenges that we're facing now, we've got to own more of this. You know, those oil companies wouldn't be doing what they're doing if we weren't buying their gas. So, Miles, this... Well, Peter, you can attest to this. This is a conversation that you wouldn't see uh, in a lot of provinces right now. The political climate doesn't permit a conversation like this about alternatives to growth. I'm curious, Miles, if there's a connection between the court cases that we saw today and in Delgamuk and Haida and Chilcotin, is there a connection between the legal victories of First Nations in defining the land question in British Columbia and the fact that we're able to have a conversation that goes beyond the traditional spectrum that we see in the rest of Canada? 
You mean in terms of economic growth? It just seems to me that there are some ideas being thrown out on this stage that would be anathema in other contexts. But in BC, there seems to be a hunger to have a conversation about economics that goes beyond the pages of the Financial Post. I'm wondering if there's a connection between that and the fact that there are no treaties here, that we are redefining title. I, I, in, in my comments, I tried to make that connection between that's one thing that's going on here in Canada is, is the governing, our governing institutions denying both Aboriginal title, which is legally, clearly, unquestionably exists, they're denying it, and our institutions, by their actions, are also de facto denying climate change. So how we address that, I suggested, was that we live our values. And I really think that there's a hunger in this country to figure out a way to make that happen. You know, what's a country? Bill Reed used to say to me you know, in the heat of our political battles that Canada's nothing more than an excuse to build a railroad anyway. You know, that, that's the way he saw it. But countries are built built on values that bind people together. And we still have differences, but we have these values that we share in institutions where we can collectively make decisions so that at least we're not bonking each other over the head when we disagree. We have to make those work. So, and, and those two issues are issues that generally we've been allowing our political leaders, so-called, our political representatives and their institutions that they occupy to deny. And for, for our society to work, for our systems to work, I think we need to own the dialogue more, to make sure that we know what the, the f truth is, what the facts are that are going into it, and what the role of each of the players are, and keep them accountable, but through a dialogue that we're all involved in. But I, I see a real hunger for that across the country. David, I want to give you the final word. <laughs> the second to final word. On this question of reconciliation between natural laws and Canadian law, between indigenous law and colonial law, you said that we didn't get far enough into answering that question before the intermission. Where's your mind going? No, that's, uh, that's not why, what I said before the intermission, oh. but anyway. Uh, Jesus, I don't know what the hell your question even is. I... <clears throat> Fair enough. <laughs> Does anybody have questions for David? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to end all this. This stuff's all way over my head now. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, well, the whole reconciliation thing, there's something else involved for me in my interest in First Nations, of course. Miles is always asking Canadians to live up to what they, feel, they say and feel they are. You know, if we've signed treaties, live up to what the treaties said. That's all he's asking us to, uh, to do, which I find really uh, humiliating to think that we we say all kinds of things, but we don't live up to that. But I've, I've looked to First Nations now. As you know, they're leading the, many of the battles that we're having across the country because they have something fundamentally different from uh, the dominant society, and that is a sense, a long history that is tied to the land that we don't have. Oh, this is a whole hour speech, I'm afraid, that I have to go into. See. If you look at the, the history of humans, we were born 150,000 years ago in the plains of Africa. That was our, our home. And over time we moved, I don't know why we moved, probably some, po some population growth, maybe resource depletion and maybe young bucks wanting to check out the Neanderthal chicks on the other side of the mountain. I don't, I, I don't know, I mean, we bred with Neanderthals. Anyway, we moved out of our birthplace and wherever we went, we were an invasive species. 
We didn't know how things worked. We just suddenly, my God, there are birds there with no wings that don't fly and they're easy to catch. And you can follow the movement of humans across the planet by the wave of extinction that, that uh, followed us. But as people began to run out of resources, they must have said, holy cow, we're, we've got two choices. We can either move and look for some more, or we're going to stay and have to live a different way. And over long periods of time, their mistakes, their failures, and their successes became their, their strategy for survival. That became indigenous knowledge of place. Science can never duplicate that because it was based on survival. You survive by the failures and mistakes that you made. And that's something, that sense of rootedness in place is something I think that we lack. I think of, you know, the, the wave of occupation that started with Columbus, I guess. But my grandparents were part of that wave where they came in 19, between 1902 and 1904. My parents were born in Vancouver, 1909, 1911. And like all the Japanese Canadian kids born at that time, they had no grandparents and they had no elders. They had no roots here. Their whole outlook was based on their parents who were uneducated, poor, and came for opportunity. So they looked out and they didn't see the, the land and, and what was on it the way the indigenous people did. They saw opportunity. They saw resources. And so I believe that what we've, we have to go back to the people that we've tried to stamp out their indigenousness and go back to them and say, thank God you've held on to it. Show us, show us what that sense is. Show us how we develop that sense of responsibility and the, the uh, tie, the, the uh, connectedness to the land. That's... I didn't answer your question, but... I'd say you did. We could go on all night, but it's 10 o'clock and most of us have work tomorrow. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers, Miles, Peter, David, Marin, Andrea. This has been quite a privilege to be up here. You know that game where it's like, who would you like to have over for dinner? Anybody living or dead? And you sort of go down the list. Well, this is, this is, uh, this is a pretty good top five. So thanks so much for joining us tonight. I know that Andreas is going to say a couple of words. Is that true? Just to close things out. He's giving me the sign of capitulation. We're going to wrap things up and get you home. Thank you so much for spending the evening with us.